This is Albert Gonzalez, America's most famous hacker. He made headlines as the youngest teenager to hack into NASA. But what really made him infamous was when he pulled off the world's biggest credit card scam, stealing a mind-blowing 170 million credit card numbers. Yes, you heard it right, 170 millions. But the question is, how did he manage to steal so many credit cards? And what happened next? Did the FBI catch him? This is a crazy true story of Albert Gonzalez, which is filled with suspense, unexpected twists, and unbelievable hacking skills, and many more. Welcome to the fascinating story of Albert Gonzalez and his epic 170 million credit card empire. Albert Gonzalez was born on October 1st, 1981 in Florida. Ever since he was little, he loved playing around with computers and figuring out how they worked. While other kids were busy with games, Albert was busy exploring the world of technology. As Albert grew up and went to school in Miami, everyone noticed how smart he was with computers. He was like a computer genius to his classmates because he could do all sorts of cool stuff with them, like writing programs and knowing about hacking. But here's the thing. Albert didn't always use his computer skills for good. At the age of 12, he started learning about hacking. Within two years, at the age of 14, he hacked into NASA. When he hacked NASA, an FBI team visited his high school, but they didn't do anything. Because Gonzalez didn't harm any of NASA data, and also he is just 14 years old, so the FBI team let him go. But the FBI made a mistake to let him go because this thing gives him more confidence to commit a bigger crime than this, which he did later. Once Albert started high school, he began ignoring his homework, and his grades started dropping a lot. He was spending all his time in online chat rooms about programming, especially at night. That's where he came up with his first nickname, Soap Nazi, inspired by a character from the TV show Seinfeld. His love for computers only got stronger during high school. He became the leader of a group of computer enthusiasts like himself, where everyone loves to talk about computer hacking. Albert joined chat rooms where hackers hang out. They talked about hacking into internet security and other tech stuff. Albert got really into it, spending lots of time learning and sharing tips with his hacker friends. He wasn't trying to make money from his hacking skills. Instead, he was like a locksmith trying to pick locks in computer security. He also wanted to prove to regular programmers that he was better than them. In the world of hacking, Albert was the top dog. In 1999, Albert finished high school. A few months later, he visited one of his online friends, Stephen Watts. They bonded over their love for computer programming and hacking. During his first year of college, Albert taught himself how to hack into internet service providers, which gave him free broadband. But soon he realized he could do even more. He started using the credentials of managers and executives to learn even more about how the systems worked. Albert got bored with his college classes pretty quickly and dropped out after just one semester. He moved to New York and got a couple of jobs. First, he worked at a dot-com company, but that job was boring, so he quit. Then he landed a job at Siemens, but he left when the company moved away from New York. In 2002, Albert found himself out of work, but he needed money. So he became one of the leaders of Shadow Crew, a forum where cyber criminals traded all sorts of illegal services, like selling credit card numbers and social security cards, and planning computer crimes. Now, it was time for the real fun to begin. Albert and his group, Shadow Crew stealing rich people's credit card numbers and selling them somewhere else and making money. They were making huge amounts of money from this until one day Albert made a mistake. In July 2003, late at night, there was a detective from the New York Police Department who was investigating car thefts in Upper Manhattan. This detective, who was dressed in regular clothes, saw a young man who looked suspicious. The young man had long, messy hair and a nose ring. The detective followed him into a bank's ATM lobby. The detective pretended to use one of the ATM machines and watched closely as the young man took out a credit card from his pocket. He withdrew a lot of money from the machine, then he used another card and did the same thing. He kept doing this with several cards. The detective thought the young man might not be stealing cars, but he was definitely up to something illegal. It turned out the young man was doing something called cashing out. He had taken blank debit cards and put stolen card numbers on them. Then, he was withdrawing as much money as he could from each of these accounts. He chose to do this just before midnight because that's when the daily limit for withdrawals ends. By doing it then, he could take out more money after midnight. 
To hide his identity, he wore a wig that looked like a woman's hair and a fake nose ring made of cheap jewelry. When the detective asked for his name, the young man, whose real name was Albert Gonzalez, and he didn't lie. Even though he used different names on the internet, like Kumbajani or Segvek, his favorite alias was Supnazi. After Gonzalez got caught by the police, they took him into custody. Albert Gonzalez was brought in for questioning, and it turned out he was a gold mine of information. Not only did he have data on millions of stolen card accounts stored on his computer back at home, but he also had a talent for explaining how he pulled off his online scams. He was smart and knew the ins and outs of computers and fraud really well. But here's the twist. Gonzalez wasn't just some small-time thief. Law enforcement soon realized he was much more than that. Gonzalez was not just any ordinary thief. He was deeply involved in a shady online community called shadowcrew.com. This website was like a marketplace for cyber criminals, where they traded stolen credit card information and shared tips on how to commit fraud. It was kind of like eBay, Monster.com, and MySpace, but for criminals. Even though Gonzalez was involved in doing some illegal activities, he decided to help the government so he wouldn't get into more trouble. After talking with them a few times, he agreed to assist them. The government asked him to join a special team called Operation Firewall, which was all about stopping cybercrime at the national level. While Gonzalez worked with the government agents, he noticed they didn't know much about computers. This made him feel even more confident in his skills. Even though he was helping the government, Gonzalez continued his criminal activities. He spent a lot of time with the agents, and they became close. But inside, Gonzalez believes his loyalty was always with the hacker community. In October 2004, while Gonzalez was learning how the police operated, he assisted them in catching some people from the Shadow Crew forum. Then, because he was a leader in the forum and didn't face any charges, it was easy for the other members to figure out he was the one helping the police. So, for his safety, the police told him to go back to his hometown, Miami. Albert went back to Miami, but he couldn't relax there. He was planning another crime. He started looking into how easy it was to hack into corporate wireless networks. He found that just like in the late 1990s, when companies didn't focus on keeping their data safe online, many companies were also careless with their Wi-Fi networks in the early 2000s. Albert was especially interested in a method called war driving. This is where hackers would drive around in a car with a powerful antenna, searching for vulnerable Wi-Fi networks at businesses. With the right skills, a hacker could break into a big company's server in just a few minutes. Now these friends decided to take a risky path. There was Albert, who had big dreams of success. Then there was Christopher, Albert's old buddy from online chat rooms. Christopher had a special talent for finding unprotected Wi-Fi networks, a skill called war driving. One day, Christopher used his talent to break into the computer systems of two big stores, BJ's Wholesale Club and DSW. He managed to steal a whopping 400,000 credit card numbers from them. Christopher shared this treasure trove with Albert, who saw it as a chance to make big money. But as they plotted their next move, they knew they were playing with fire. Getting caught could mean serious trouble. On the other side, the government is happy with Albert's work. He helped the government to catch some of the hackers. So, Albert ended up becoming a paid informant for the Secret Service in Miami. This means he was helping them with their investigations, and they were paying him for it. Albert was paid a salary of $75,000 per year by the U.S. Secret Service. But here's the twist. Albert's lifestyle took a wild turn. He was living it up big time. He was spending a lot on sports cars, fancy apartments, and luxurious hotel rooms in Miami. He didn't hesitate to spend money on eating out, going to clubs, and even buying drugs. And guess what? He threw himself a big birthday party that cost a huge $75,000. On top of all this, Albert was also running his own illegal business on the side. He and Scott were selling stolen credit card information to other hackers. These hackers were already being investigated by the Secret Service, so Albert and Scott were basically setting them up by selling them data from companies that were already being looked into for breaches. So imagine Albert's double life. By day, he's working with the Secret Service, and by night, he's managing his illegal business of selling stolen credit card details. It's like living in two completely different worlds at the same time. However, every story has its ups and downs, and Albert's was no different and soon his good days are coming to an end. In 2007, 
Albert was tired of his job and not doing well at it. He was also bored with war driving, a way of finding Wi-Fi networks. So he looked for something new and found SQL injection. Now what is SQL injection? SQL injection is a sneaky technique used by hackers to mess with a website or application that interacts with a database. Imagine a form on a website where you type in your username and password. If the website isn't well guarded, a hacker might enter some tricky code into that form instead of normal text. This code can then mess with the website's database, giving the hacker access to sensitive information or even letting them take control of the website. Albert could break into a company's database. What excited him was that he could do this from anywhere with the internet, unlike war driving where he had to be physically near a place. Stephen and Patrick wrote special computer programs that their team could use secretly for their undercover work. They were very careful and used a lot of tricks to hide where they were working from. First, they set up a complicated system using 20 different layers of protection to hide their own location on the internet. This made it really hard for anyone to figure out where they were operating from. Then, Albert and Patrick would look at lists of big, important companies to find the ones they wanted to target. They'd find out what kind of computers these companies used and then visit one of their stores to check out the computers they used for customers to pay at the checkout. After that, they'd break into the company's computer systems through the company's websites. They'd use sneaky software called malware to do this. They were very careful and tested their malware against lots of different security programs to make sure it wouldn't get caught. Once they were in, they'd steal credit card information from the company's servers. They did this in small amounts at a time, so it wouldn't set off any alarms for the people who managed the servers. After they got what they wanted, they'd cover their tracks by deleting any evidence that they were there. They'd also leave secret ways to get back into the system later if they needed to. By the end of 2007, Gonzalez and his team had sneaked into the computer systems of big companies like Target, Office Max, Barnes & Noble, and others. They did this to steal credit card information from millions of people. Surprisingly, a lot of this information was just sitting there without any protection. Thereafter, Gonzalez teamed up with a guy from Ukraine named Maxim Yastremsky to form a group. This Maxim is playing a big role in Albert Gonzalez's life. They plan to sell the stolen credit card details all over the world, in places like America, Europe, and Asia. To handle the money from these illegal sales, Gonzalez created fake companies in Europe. Soon, Gonzalez teamed up with two hackers from Europe. Together, they plan to break into the systems that process payments for credit cards, which are like the main roads for moving money around. The government got suspicious about Albert because he was often late, especially for work. So they started secretly watching him to see what he was up to. After looking for a while, the government finally caught Albert and his friend Steven in Miami in May 2008. When they caught them, they found a gun, two laptops, and $25,000 in cash. But this evidence is not enough for the Albert case, and his gig got busted when one of his main players, Maxim, was caught by the cops. They found tons of stolen card numbers and evidence of hacking on Maxim's laptop, plus chats between him and Albert. Then another friend of Albert's, Patrick, got nabbed in Miami. Instead of sticking by Albert, Patrick decided to help the cops. His info was super important in taking down Albert's whole operation. Patrick got a lighter sentence because of his cooperation. When the cops finally caught Albert, they dug into his computers and were shocked by how big his operation was. They found out he had a whole crew working for him all over the world. The government ended up charging 11 people who were part of Albert's crew. They figured out that their scam cost banks and other companies around $200 million. But it's hard to say exactly how much damage they did because it affected so many businesses and millions of people. Stephen Watts admitted to writing the code that helped Albert's illegal operation, but he claimed he didn't know it was being used for bad stuff and didn't make any money from it. However, the court and judge didn't buy it completely. They sentenced him to two years in prison and told him to pay some of the money lost from the crimes. Albert felt sorry for what he did. He said he never realized how many people his actions hurt and he apologized for causing so much trouble. When Patrick and his friends started working with the police, Albert decided to cooperate too. Because of his help, he got a 20-year prison sentence, the longest ever for a computer crime. Before going to jail, he admitted he messed up big time and blamed only himself. He also mentioned how a government agency had given him a chance, but he threw that away. 
If Gonzalez behaves well and follows the rules in prison, he'll be released in 2025.